Thank you for, uh, for everybody for coming. And uh, again, thanks to the B&H uh, folks for having me back. Uh, I was here last month. I uh, did a class on headshots. And we're going to be doing another, uh, another add-on to that one on advanced headshots, I think, in coming up in July. I think July 12th. So um, doing something right. They keep having me back. So <laughs> anyway, but uh, th again, thanks for coming. Um, this class today is, is I think one of my favorites because we get to really dive in and look at imagery. And you know, I will I will preface everything that I'm going to say with that this that that almost all of this is is my own work. So whether you like it or you don't like it, that's what's great. That's what makes everything. I mean, everybody has their own opinion. Uh, of what makes a great photograph. I'm not sitting here and telling you that any of these photographs are great photographs. That's, that's up for you to decide. Uh, but I have studied with, and, uh, with an enormous amount of tremendously talented photographers and image makers throughout the world. And uh, I've learned a thing or two in the last 30 years of doing this. Um, so whether it's right or wrong, again, is irrelevant. But I will share with you some of the tips that have been tried and tested throughout the years to really, I think, make an impact. That's what really, when you look at a photograph, what makes you continue to look at it? And then when you're done looking at it, you can't keep your eyes off of it. Impact. If it keeps you there, I think the, the job of that photograph or that image, whatever it is, a painting, has done its job. Um, so that's the number one thing. So for me, um, this class is how to improve your photography. And I think, again, the, the impact is really where it's at. A lot of this is going to be uh, on compositional techniques, things like that. Uh, we're going to go over some things like you've probably heard the rule of thirds and things like that. Um, if you haven't, this is a good place for you to be. Uh, but there's a lot of other things that, that go into making uh, whether it's a good photograph, a great photograph, or a bad photograph. Someone may look at a photograph and say, I don't like that. And someone may say, oh my gosh, I love that photograph. Again, that's what makes us all different. So uh, all right. So just to give you, um, I, I already mentioned the word composition. And, and, when I, I, and I didn't title this class composition because it, it, I don't want it to sound boring for you guys. And when you say, I'm going to a class on composition, um, it will probably turn a lot of you off. I want to make this more exciting, more visually appealing, and not go over boring textbook kind of things. Uh, so hopefully, we'll, we'll do that. But to understand composition, I think, is huge. Uh, who thinks they have a really good, good fit, you know, idea on what composition is all about? Anybody in the room? OK. I don't even know if I do. Because we're constantly changing uh, what we like and what we don't like. I mean, what you liked 15 years ago may be completely different from how you feel about something today. So to implement the composition, I think, is the most important thing. Because it's one thing to understand it, but if you can't do it, then what's the point? You could tell somebody else how to do it. But if you can't do it, then therein lie some of the problems. Uh, we're going to go over some basic rules. Uh, and then, of course, those basic rules are just very much guidelines. They're not necessarily a hard and fast rule. But one thing that I've learned is I learn those rules, quote unquote, and then I will forget those rules. There's no rule that says you have to do it a certain way. And rules are meant to be broken. OK. Uh, a lot of it's about artistic vision. And again, that's what makes every one of us different on how we look and what our opinions are of a particular photograph or, or painting or whatever it may be, uh, whether it's a graphic image or, or what have you. So all right. And then uh, applying these techniques, once you, once you start learning these, again, quote unquote, rules. Hi. Uh, I know. She's back. Um, and then being able to just have them like, you know, it's like riding a bike. Once you know it, 
you pretty much don't forget it and then it, it, it'll instantly start. As soon as you pick the camera up and you're looking in the viewfinder, you're looking for something. In fact, you probably are even finding something that's even more appealing without having the, the camera up to your eye. You're pre-visualizing what the scene will look like before you even get your camera up to your eye. And that's what I find myself doing constantly, uh, especially when I, when I was starting to learn uh, natural light really, really well. I was always looking for lighting direction and how it played with uh, shadows and contrast in the scene. So all those things I kept looking. Do you guys find yourselves doing this when you're looking around town or wherever you live? You're looking for things that, oh wow, that would make a great photograph. Mm -hmm. um, I do it constantly. And maybe it's just me. But ultimately, uh, some of these rules, and then when you break these rules, will make you a better image maker. So those are kind of some important things. So again, we're going to go over just a couple of things here, overview for what we're going to cover today. Um, the rules of composition, I've already covered that already. Pre-visualization is something that uh, I find, we were just talking about it, that's kind of key to finding great photographs within a scene. And they're there. Uh, sometimes you may, I taught a class for um, an organization in Las Vegas this past winter. And the idea of this class was to pick the worst possible location and let's make a great photograph there. And I, I left it up to the class to pick the absolute worst possible location they could find. And they challenged me and I beat them. So those kind of things happen all the time. We've got something here, it may be horrible, but let's make something out of it. That's kind of important. Um, lens selection plays a key role in a lot of how you compose your photograph. Um, you know, optics are a huge part of photography. Uh, physics within the optics play a big role. When I say that, I mean, you know, do you have, you know, wide angle lenses typically have a lot more depth of field inherently built into them than they do with like a telephoto lens. So using those tools and knowing when you look at a scene, what lens you may want to use will help figure out the overall composition of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, we'll look at a lot of good examples. We'll look at some bad examples. And did anybody in the room bring, I, I know it was written on, the, on the, the description, did anybody bring any images for us to look at? OK, cool. We got one person. Awesome. Anybody else? OK, so what we'll do, did you bring them on a thumb drive? Yeah. OK, I don't need them just yet. But if we have time at the end, uh, I'm glad you brought them. Are you brave enough to, to yeah. all right, awesome, I love that. Because it's a learning environment. We're supposed to, all of us are smarter than one of us. So I think, you know, if we put images out there and we go to look at them, I think I love doing that. I love looking at other people's images. I sometimes get tired looking at my own stuff, so I'm, I'm glad you brought something. Uh, okay, so we'll do some image review and critique. I'm glad you, you brought some stuff. All right, now, uh, where does your eye go in this photograph? Anyone? Socks? <laughs> that goes to the socks. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it, it very well could. And, and so you said socks. Anybody else? Where's your eye go? To the left, there's space, way too much space available. There's way too much space available. So your eye goes over to the left side of the frame? OK, see how different it is? You know, and there's no right or wrong here. It's just everybody's different opinion. Who else? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Hat and clothes at the same time. Hat and clothes at the same time. Same time yeah. So generally, um, most people, and I'm not calling you that. I'm not calling you out saying you're wrong because you're everybody's an individual. Most people's eyes, when you when you're given a scene like this, your eye has nowhere else to go in most cases. When there's a repeating pattern, if there's a whatever breaks that pattern, is usually where your eye will go. Uh, and in this case, most of you probably went and looked somewhere on uh, the gentleman that's standing on the steps here. This incidentally was a, was a few years ago uh, when Obama was president, the uh, Prime Minister of Ireland came over to have a drink on St. Paddy's Day. And I had a friend of mine who was um, a capital state uh, police captain, and he got me special access to photograph in and there. And when you've got 
Secret Service up on the rooftops with sniper rifles on you when you're holding a big lens like this. It's kind of a, a, a humbling moment. <laughs> but uh, anyway, they were waiting for Obama and the prime minister to show up, and they were walking up the steps. There was kind of an interesting time. Uh, but composition defined is the act of combining parts or elements to form a whole. Boring, right? That's the, when I looked it up, that was the definition that was written. So composition, I think that this for me is, is even stronger when, I, when we say composition is the strongest way of seeing. Somebody, I don't know who quoted, who coined the phrase, but I think it speaks a lot to me. Um, so, all right, let's look at some images because I know you want to you want to see some stuff. Uh, we'll look at some good images and and maybe some not so good images. And again, it's going to vary depending on what's there. So, uh, when I was in Washington doing that last image, this was another one that we did. It was during the Cherry Blossom Festival um, down in Washington D.C. And um, so, have you ever heard of foreground, middle ground, and background? Kind of an important, now not every photograph can accomplish those three things, but when I can, it speaks loudly to me. And if you can differentiate the foreground and the middle ground and the background, I think those are important things. But uh, you know, where does your eye go on this photograph? It may be different areas. Uh, go ahead. The building? Okay, that's the, I think that's the Jefferson Memorial there. Uh, uh, the other one is, is obviously the Washington Monument. Um, but having, whenever you have a sky that may not be particularly interesting, I think up in the upper third of this image, uh, it, I love to fill it with something. And if it's just a plain blue sky, now this was just after a storm rolled through, um, and what I did was I took my camera there after that storm came through, I took my camera and I laid it right down in front of a puddle. That's not a lake there. That's literally a puddle that's about four feet wide. And this is in the, the tidal basin, uh -huh. if any of you have been down there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and all I did, it was with the, the 16 to 35 L-series lens. And I just, I didn't put it in the water, but I laid it right in front. <laughs> of uh, the water, and I saw this beautiful reflection, and I thought, wow, how interesting would that be, rather than have, because this is, a, I think, a jogging path or a, you know, something there. And uh, when I just tipped the camera up, the cherry blossoms came. Now, you can't see any detail in the cherry blossoms. They're silhouetted, but I still think it, it blends in with the frame nicely. Uh, so, interesting. Now, the original image I had, because I, the camera was not level, it was tipped up. You got this, this bowing, like the, the horizon line there had a bow to it because of distortion. Uh, so that's very, pretty easy just to clean up. Um, it looked distracting. I, I could have probably put, um, you know, uh, uh, like the 14 to 24 rectilinear correction lens on there or a tilt shift lens and maybe a correction there. But, uh, you know, it's very easy to just to straighten that out. And it wasn't a major correction. Okay, what about this image? Where does your eye go? To the lighthouse. To the lighthouse. Anybody know why? Leading, Leading lines. lines. Awesome. You guys want to get up here and teach? <laughs> In the other photo, the clouds and the puddle were actually based on also leading lines towards the Okay, so the gentleman in the front row said, in the last image, the clouds and the puddle also made leading lines. Uh, you're talking about this yeah. here, and yeah. yeah, it leads you right to the Jefferson Memorial. Um, good point. So, but leading lines are a huge part of forcing the viewer's eye to go where you want it to. What's some of the other ones? Now, no, don't, those of you who are in my headshot class, I'm pointing to you over here, don't yell it out. But your eye goes to two main areas when you look at an image. Can anyone tell me where those two places are? Brightest thing, highlights and shadows. Highlights and shadows. You're on. You're 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 like you're you're there. But just give me another yeah, word. Sharpest. sharpest. Okay. Sharpest focus. Yes, that's one of them. And then the, the area of. The size of the so let's go with. He's got one sharpest focus, and you you're there. I'm just going to put it in a different word. Area of greatest contrast. So when you said area of brightest or the brightest area, you, you're right. You're there. You're like <clears throat> you're just there. Uh, but what if the whole image is bright and then you've got one dark 
thing in the image. So if you have a, a you know you have a white background with a with a a bride that's got a white dress, and your eye goes to the area of greatest contrast, which would probably be the skin in that point, or maybe something, another prop or something in the image. So yeah, so those areas are are really a, a big thing when it comes to figuring out where your eye, where the viewer's eye is going to go in the image, area of greatest contrast. But leading lines are a huge, huge thing uh, that you want to try to incorporate into your your images. Uh, this is my lovely wife. Um, and this was interesting. So we've got a lot of negative space here. Uh, and But it, it kind of all ties together, in my opinion, with the, the fall colors and the, the, the color of her, of her jacket. Um, so I, you know, there's a, there's another thing about framing. If you look at the, the the um, what's that called? Column. The columns, but the whole thing is called a gazebo. Thank you. I just got back from Yellowstone. And I'm still fried from that. Um, but framing out parts of your subject will also be a good thing to to imp implement into your photography. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, and, and the answer to everything in photography is it depends. So if it works for you, it works for it probably works for somebody else. Okay, talking about leading lines again. Uh, another great thing about a composition is using color in a very monochrome type environment. Uh, this my eye goes right to her face and, and the bow that she's wearing, and then I go into the red of her outfit, and it's the strongest color in the image, minus perhaps maybe the green, uh, but it, it's not the green in, uh, that's growing on the, the, the siding is an, an overwhelming piece that draws my attention. But you've got the, the slats there from the, from the uh, siding that are leading you into the little girl here. So, that's something nice. And then you add a block at the end. Typically in this country, we read from left to right. Uh, so typically, I will use that as a compositional aid from left to right, you, especially when we're talking about leading lines. Uh, I'll, it meanders through the photograph, and then eventually you'll get to your subject. And then I usually will put a block to keep you from exiting. One thing I won't do is, or rarely do, sometimes you can't avoid it, is have a leading line go right out of the photograph. It just, it, and there's nothing to block you there. And I have a good example of that I'll show you later from uh, Yellowstone. Okay, framing. This again is a really great opportunity for framing. And, and it, moments like this uh, happen so quickly uh, that you have to be ready for it. This was at a, a New Jersey balloon festival several years ago. And you've got all these balloons that are taking off at the same time. And to be able to see you know, just you're photographing left and right things very, very quickly. And then this popped up and I said, I've got to get this. So you've got to have your focus in a, in a position maybe on one point where you can get to the thing you want to be focused on very quickly without having to change. You know, if you have all focusing points active, the way that autofocus works is, is it focuses on the closest thing it sees with reliable detail, which is this right here. So the, the uh, folks there in the background in the basket in the other balloon would have been out of focus. Um, or at least if I had, if I had a, let my lens closed down, they'd probably be slightly out of focus uh, with depth of field. But nonetheless, um, having, being ready for something like that is, is critical because it only lasts for, for a brief amount of time. Now this, this scene, things aren't moving very quickly here, obviously. But where does your eye go? Talking about color my eye goes to the flower. And then you have these repeating lines. Again, repeating lines are, are generally a very strong thing. And when you can interrupt those lines with color or another object, that becomes um, a strong compositional aid. Now, when you're talking about graphic stuff, um, this was photographed from very, very high uh, this is a, a cycling race in Philadelphia that happens yearly. And this was photographed with a 400 millimeter lens from a very high angle up on a cliff, photographing down. This is the crosswalk that you would see in the road. And then so just being able to get in there very tight and use those graphic lines as a, you know, an, an element to the photograph makes it pretty strong, in my opinion. You may feel differently about it. But I like it. 
Okay, um, now, some basic rule stuff. We talked about color. Your eye generally would probably go to the flower here because it's a fairly, fairly monochromatic setting. But th we're going to talk here about the rule of thirds. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, generally if you take a tic-tac-toe board and you put it in your frame, you divide it up the horizontal thirds with two lines and the vertical thirds with two lines. And wherever those lines intersect, those are generally strong compositional areas. Now that's not to say that you should use them all the time, but, uh, and there's always reasons to center your photograph or center your subject within your frame. Uh, but try to avoid it unless you're intentionally doing that. In other words, if something graphically appears that really begs to be centered in the frame, sure, go ahead and do it. Uh, but you'll find that if you are looking into the canvas, which is your frame, if there's reasons to offset things on the thirds, let's try to do that. Again, there's always rules that can be broken. So those, those areas, again, strong intersections are, are kind of uh, important areas. Now you could put um, subjects on, you know, whether it's a vertical subject on the right third, you could, you know, whether you're using both thirds or one of the thirds at the same time, those are, those are kind of nice. But in this example here, we've got leading lines and the rule of thirds all in one. It's on, the, it's on the right third. We've got leading lines from the, the wake from the uh, mallard. And your eye goes right up to the, the mallard's head, which incidentally is on the upper right third. So there's your leading lines. So some basic rules of composition. Again, getting into this use of color is, is kind of nice. Um, when you ha I, love, I love working with red. Um, you'll probably notice that a lot in my work. Red is just, it, it, it comes to, it speaks to me and it draws my eye in. Um, soft colors also work very well in the exact opposite of that last image. You've got a lot of very soft images here, like, like in, a, in a foggy environment. Same thing, your eye goes to that area of greatest contrast. So in this case, uh, this is up in Bar Harbor, Maine, and um, your eye goes right to that boat. And it helps having the, the, the fog there to take all those distracting elements out of the back of the image. So, so interruptions, we talked about this, interruptions in a repeating pattern. So this, again, is another good example. Now, to your question, when, I mean, how, there's a lot of negative space on here, right? I mean, he's, this guy shoved all the way down here. Now, he's not on the rule of thirds, right? right? And it's okay to break those rules if it works. And it may not work for some of you, but it worked for me. Uh, this is not my image, but uh, this is a colleague of mine, Rudy Winston, but I love what's going on here. And it forces your eye to move around. Now, once you get to the subject, you may wander around, and that's great. You know, uh, I love looking at the columns in the building and how the light's playing with them. Uh, that's kind of fun. This image here, again, repeating patterns. And I goes right to her. But then I wander around a little bit, but I always end up back at the subject. Okay. Subject isolation, we talked about this one already. Uh, this is a really good example of subject isolation because you, you know, it's just framing your, whenever you can use a natural element to frame out your subject, it's going to help. Now, there's a lot of things that can pull your attention away here. Balloons are typically very colorful, um, but I think when you've got the predominant you know, frame covered in a lot of different bright colors, your eye tends to go to the opposite area, which is in the background there. Okay. Now, here's that ex exact image I was going to tell you about. Again, not the rule of thirds, but I've pushed this building all the way over to the right of the frame. And your eye has nowhere else to go because I loved the gradient that was happening with that sun setting behind the building there. Is it a great photograph? I think it's an okay photograph. It's not, it's, it's not going to win any awards, I don't think, but um, it does speak to composition. Negative space. So if there's, is there too much negative space? Uh, like I said, perhaps maybe, um, but maybe not. It's all open to interpretation. 
and there's no right or wrong because you're the artist, right? So there's your negative space. Balance is a tough thing. Uh, how much do I need negative space to really achieve a proper balance in the photograph? I don't know. I guess it depends on the photograph or what, what the elements in that image. But don't be afraid to push the limits. Try different uh, variations of the same image. And if your eye gets drawn away, like if I were to incorporate, if I were to go back and put more of this building or, you know, maybe this, I, I'm going off the edge of the building and there's something else taking my attention over here in between the buildings, your, your eye would, would go here and then it would get lost over here a little bit with other buildings and it, it doesn't block you. This building blocks you from going anywhere else. That make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay, rule of odds. Has anybody ever heard this? We've heard the rule of thirds. Uh, rule of odds, I'm a big fan of photographing things in threes. My wife was an art student in Syracuse and she, she turned me on to the rule of odds uh, and I use it now constantly. So when I first look at this image, yeah, I've got, I could argue that there's more than three things to look at here, but typically one, two, three. And it, it, it just speaks to me and it makes sense. Fill the frame, has anybody heard this? All right, there are, we've given you a lot of resolution in your cameras. And I'm speaking to the digital folks in the room. I know there's the one Canon AE-1. Who had that, that you right here? I love that you brought the Canon AE-1, it's awesome. Uh, I, I wish I could go back to photographing with film. I just, sometimes I do with four by five, but uh, I, I, it, it brings me back to a day. But fill the frame. Uh, so when you have it, we've given you the resolution use that resolution appropriately uh, and fill your frame as best you can. I, you know, for years, you know, uh, the company named Kodak had pretty much given us a set number of sizes. We had four by six, we had five by seven, we had eight by 10 and 11 by 14. And those were the sizes when you would go and get your prints made. They dictated the size. And I hate that because every image that you take doesn't necessarily conform to those preset sizes, and it shouldn't. So that's why I have a, a, a large format printer. I have a 44 inch printer, and I can make I can make a, a 44 inch by four inch print if I want, if the, if it came down to that. So I have that whole canvas to use, or very little of it to use, and if the image is appropriate for that size, that's the size I'm going to make it or the, or the crop that I'm going to make it or the dimensions I'm going to make it. I don't want any company to dictate to me what size I need to make an image. Um, so if I'm photographing this, the, the skyline of New York from Weehawken and I do a, a panoramic image, uh, it's going to be a very slender, long print. And I can't do that on an 11 by 14 without having a lot of sky and, and water in the, in the top and bottom of the frame. So yes, you could trim that image, but I like making it the way I artistically saw it in my head the first time. So you have that blank canvas, use it. Here's another example. Um, this is in my town down in South Jersey. Uh, eh, it's okay, right? It's a nice sunset, we see them. Let's talk about pre-visualizing. Now, I had somebody with me uh, that presented themselves and where do I put them in, in this image? Let me ask you, there's the person there. You can barely see them, right? You have to work to find them. So what's better, this or that? Yeah, I like this one better because now she's silhouetted in the frame. I, again, getting back to the area of greatest contrast. Yeah, sure, there's a lot of contrast over here and up here, but I, I end up looking down here every time. So I, I'll go back. There you get this here. She gets getting lost there in the water versus that. And all it took was, you know, hey, can you get up and back up 10 feet? Pretty simple. 
So anyway, um, don't be afraid to, to push the limit. Tell, ask your subject. If you see a, a highlight or something like that, tell them to move a little bit, it, it's, or you move. Whatever. If you know, if it's a, some, if you're doing street photography, it's difficult to uh, say to somebody, "Hey, can you move back ten feet?" Yeah. You know, uh, that. Be, I mean, you could do it, but you might. Not, you know, oftentimes street photography, you don't want people to know you're taking their picture. So here's that scene, uh, and then what? What this girl did was she had a, um, she had a Indian headdress, and she had put this on. This is a a, a, a very old traditional headdress, I think. And so what we ended up doing was, when we did this class, I said, look, let's put her um, right in the, the sun reflection. And these clouds, you know, were the sun peeked through the clouds there. For, the light was flat. And then the sun was setting. It peeked through the clouds. And then we ended up with this. You know, if that sun was directly in the in the frame, it would have ruined it. So we just use her as a block or your, whoever the subject is, and um, you know, it, it, this tells a story, and that's another great element of composition. Does it tell a story? Can you get into it and read a bit? You know, read into what's in the image. Here's another great one. One of the one of the great things about my job is I get to travel around a lot and, and teach, and then at the end of the class, we usually find ourselves in a bar somewhere. Um, and while I was drinking this glass of wine, I found these tea lights on all the tables. And I thought, that's going to be interesting. Let's, this was when the 100 millimeter L series macro first came out. And when I had just gotten it, I said, let's, let's try messing around with this. This will be kind of fun. And I said restaurant here, but it was actually a bar. But this happened. So, and the only thing I did was I, I put the camera, I laid it down on the table, and I put my wallet to suspend the lens up so it would be without falling down and looking at the granite on the table, or whatever that is. Um, but it didn't, that's all it was. It wasn't taken in a studio. I mean, you're looking at it. It's got visual impact. So, um, but rather interesting how things present themselves. And this is, again, a situation where centering your subject can work. So, you know, you could argue that these are on the rule, or close to the rule of thirds on the vertical side, but not quite. But I love just the color and how it played. So you've got blue over here, which is reflecting in the right side of the stem and, the, and that wine glass, and the exact opposite with, with the green. Uh, I played with the red, green, and blue because that's what makes up white light, red, green, and blue. RGB. RGB. OK. Uh, here's another one. This is down in Norfolk, Virginia. I hope I said that right, Norfolk. Uh, this is the USS Wisconsin. And yeah, it's been docked for some time. But there are pictures within this picture. Can anybody see where you might go with maybe if you put a telephoto lens on, where, what could happen here? Take a look. This is what I love doing about this. So there are, there are lots of photographs in here. If you just, I'm a big telephoto guy. I love getting into certain areas of an image. Uh, and then this is what happened. So cutting out all the stuff. You know, obviously on the one in the photograph on the on the left there, you can see that you know the docking <coughs> ropes or chains, whatever they are. Um, there's a lot of distracting stuff there. You've got condominiums on the right side, but just taking a 70 to 200 millimeter lens and zooming it out and getting small portions of the ship with the graphic and again centering the subject here, it works on this particular one. So work the scene until you find those gems, because they are there. OK, some techniques. Uh, you saw this picture already. Um, 
most people spend their lives photographing at their height level. And it's just because naturally, it's the way we are. We, you know, oh man, I, I got to get down here to get this photograph. It, it's, it takes some work. And as I get older, I don't really, I was photographing a bike race on Sunday and, I'm, and I thought, man, a perspective would be fantastic if I was really, really low to the ground, but it's going to take a lot of effort to get there and do I want to do this, <laughs> you know? Ultimately, I mean, my knees have suffered because I photograph a lot of kids too, so I'm always down on their level, so my knees are just shot. But you do what you do for the love of what you do. And it takes, well, it took me a little longer to get up, uh, you, you, you do it. But finding, again, finding those gems, uh, this is down in Cape May, New Jersey, um, the edge of the earth, but finding, okay, I'm just walking along this, this fence line and I saw one of the pickets was gone. And I thought, how cool would it be if I just framed out the lighthouse in, in that frame? Um, I sold a lot of these photographs. So, but get down low, get up high angle, try to find those not so traditional height level, five foot eight to six foot two area or where, however tall you are. Um, you'll find there's a lot more out there than right here. Again, repeating lines I, I, or shapes. I, I love this photograph. Uh, it's, you know, you're seeing depth in it, but you're also, you go, you go to, you wander around a little bit, but you end up, for me, I end up at the same place. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those images where I'm sitting on the ground, you know, low camera angle. Okay. So again, changing your perspective. You know, the one thing, like, when you're wandering around, we're so busy looking out here. We're not looking up here, and you're not looking down here. You're just, it's natural because you're, 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 you're generally walking in the direction you're looking, and you're, you're looking on a horizontal plane, not so much on a vertical. There's a lot of really cool graphic things, especially in an urban environment like New York City, that you could look up and see some really interesting photographs. Again, looking down, you're, you'll see, I mean, is that interesting? I don't know. But using visual stimulus to uh, talking about leading lines, uh, it all comes together in certain images, and this is one of those. Okay, more more gas pumps. I have a thing with gas pumps. I think <laughs> uh, I'm driving uh, again. I when I took the photograph of the USS Wisconsin, I'm driving back from uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And I'm on the, the Delmarva Peninsula, which is like the, by the Chesapeake Bay. And I'm driving along, and I look, and there's this old gas station house looking thing. And I drove for another mile or two, and I kept thinking about it. And I'm like, I gotta go back. Because I'm glad I did, because the next time I went down there several months later, this building was knocked over. So you've got to, you know, if you see something and you keep thinking about it, there's probably a reason why you keep thinking about it. You should go and take the picture because you don't know when these things are going to go. And this was a little gem that I found, and, and I just loved it. Um, it's very monochromatic, and then your, your eye goes right to the color. And again, that's use of color in composition. And it's not an 11 by 14. I cut a lot of the top of the building off. I cut the roof off because it just doesn't, it was drawing my eye away from what I wanted the attention to be on, which was the gas pumps. You saw this one before, same thing. Now, obviously there's multiple stories in here, um, not just the color, but there's a deeper, a way deeper story in this image. And you know, we're all thinking about it, right? Here's another story. My son and one of his friends years ago, um, but here, kid, go sit on a log and <laughs> tell me what you see. And then the boy on the left uh, was my son's friend. He, he saw a goose or something out in the water and pointed his hand and bam, that's the shot. That, if he didn't put his hand up there, it would be a different story. Right. This is nothing more than um, window light and a reflector. 
So there's a story in there too. And the story for me, there's you know two stories in there. Dad's this rough and tough kind of guy. He's got a tattoo. And then you've got this precious little baby with innocence and all that. I mean, you could go, the, in the eye contact, I think, is really what sells this for me. OK, so watch out for distractions. What distracts you in this photograph? The, sign. the, the sign. speed limit sign, absolutely. And the, I mean, all this. And, the and if, you, if you just take that yellow line and use the right side of that photograph, way better. Is it an award-winning photograph? Probably not, but I bet, the, I bet she would like it. I bet her parents would like it. What about here? I mean, there's multiple problems with this photograph, right? So we've got you know, all kinds of stuff. If you just crop, uh, it's better. Uh, you know, you could, you could come in here. The, the, the railing's still a little distracting, but it's not terrible. You could even cut that off here and just do, you know, a little tighter composition. So um, there's a story here. And I think for me, the biggest story is that it's not level. Make your horizon lines level or the appearance of your horizon lines level. Look at this. Did anybody see that when, they first, when the image first came around? Yeah. And we all do it. I have, I have this thing that whenever I'm photographing, I typically am tipping my, my camera this way for some reason, and I have to correct for it later. So that's why I turn the grid on in my viewfinder. So I can, I've got horizontal lines, and I can try to line up my horizon. You know, If I have the time to, to account for that, I'm going to correct myself. And that's what's great thing about having those grid lines that you can turn on or off in, in your camera, depending on the camera you have. Uh, it helps me correct for whatever I'm, I didn't drink my V8 or whatever. I don't know what's going on. But you know, that's a way better image. So it doesn't take, yeah, you could, you could crop it in, in Photoshop or your image editing software. Um, but you're going to lose some of the image in the crop. So. Another thing is uh, I try to avoid putting my horizon lines right in the middle of the frame uh, because you're basically splitting the horizon line in the picture in two. And the other thing that bothers me about this is that I, the horizon lines are going right through their head, or at least two of their heads. And the third, the, the girl, yeah, these guys are triplets. Um, and so they've got a, a very... <laughs> You know, as triplets do that are the same age at this, at this, you know, they're they're all they're like ten here. I think, you know, they get very, they're kids, and they're all the same age fighting for the same stuff. But these guys, this just kills it. And so, if I if I could have gotten lower or higher, I would have preferred probably to get higher, so that their head is encompassed within the water. But if you can't do that, I mean, I'm on the beach. I don't have a ladder. Um, so maybe find something you can stand on or whatever. Um, a safe place to put a horizon line is at the hips, if you can do it. And that's going to require you to get low. Uh, typically, it's, that's one of the better places to put a horizon line. Or have it go above their head, if at all possible. So that, that's a no-no for me. Not for everybody. So. This, we've got some leading lines, and, and I'm not, like, I love this part of it. And this is, uh, this is all soft here. But look where the leading lines take you, right out of the photograph. So while my wife loved this picture of our, you know, our new kid, um, it's not that there's anything wrong with it. But where you know if your eye if you follow that leading line it does take you out of the image so i would have probably loved like this is getting pretty soft up on the horizon line because again it's it's a sunset there's a lot of uh, mist in the air from the wave action uh, it gets very soft the lower that sun goes on the horizon the softer that light gets this would probably fall off into nothing if i had maybe chosen an aperture of like 2.8 or something small like that, it would have just gone to fuzz and you wouldn't see it as much. Uh, but as it is, I think that was around f4, f5, 6, and you're getting more detail in the background there. So just little things like that to look out for. But the horizon line is better placed here 
than it is going right through the middle. If there's not much interesting stuff in the sky, cut it out. There's no need for it. No. So I, you've already heard me mention about work the scene. Don't just take one picture. Try different angles. S circle the subject and photograph it from different points of view. Um, you may not have a great shot on everything, but if you at least if you give it the the old college try and move around and change your position vertically and horizontally and also surround it if at all possible, you may get that better shot. Here's what I started off. You saw me uh, the, the original photograph of this series up real high, and this is what it looked like. I mean, okay, I saw this originally, and I'm like. There's something there, but I can't find it. So I ended up moving way to my left and then trying things. OK, they're going a different way, way here. I've got yellow in there. It's still not working. Um, I love that she's encompassed within there. And then when I saw this image, I'm like, OK, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to increase my focal length to 400 millimeters. And I'm going to really hone in on those lines, because I like what's happening with the lines. So this was all an experiment. And then, OK, so now I got that. I like what's going on there, but I need more focal length. And then I ended up with something like this. And all I needed to do was just crop the top portion of that out. And now I have the graphic image that I was after. And I didn't even know it uh, initially that this was going to happen. But you find these you know, things that when you look at an image, you're like, OK, there's something there, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Let's just keep after the, keep after the, uh, the issue, and let's get that great photograph. So it takes time. And you don't always, like I said, you don't always hit a home run. OK, so there's, there's the winning shot that I've got. And I also have another one of these where I've got a group of riders, uh, which I think I actually end up liking more because it shows more of a story about, uh, you know, the storyline is there about uh, you know competition and things like that. So, oh, there it is. I did. I didn't realize I put that in there. There's the shot. I think I, I like that better. Now, what I would end up probably doing it just for, just for fun, I'd probably end up taking these guys out, and I'd probably take that wheel out up in the top, and I'd have, you know, this diagonal. Diagonals are huge. If you can ever incorporate a diagonal in your imagery. Do it. So we've got diagonals going this way. We have diagonals going this way. You've got the diagonals from the, the bike uh, down tube. Uh, there's all kinds of cool stuff in there. You just have to find it. So when to break the rules? I mean, you, you can break them whenever you want, but uh, they're meant to be broken. And But I'm a big fan of learning those rules first and then knowing when to break them and do it with intent rather than, you know, what they call, you ever heard of the expression spray and pray? Mm -hmm. Where you're just shooting everything and then hope that, you know, something comes that looks good. I mean, you throw enough against the wall, something's going to stick eventually. But if you, if you go into it with intent, uh, then you're going to have more success with it. So this was one of those times. But again, uh, center composition. Bullseye composition works. Does it improve the image then from the, the, the full scene? I think so. OK, bullseye composition. I have another one of this uh, that I cut the car in two in half vertically. And I think I like that one better than this one. Um, but again, for me, this, this speaks to that rule of odds. Now, for me, I see this, this, and that. Right. Now, you could say you got this, 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 and that's four. Uh, but for me, the main areas that grab my attention are here, here, and there. For me, it, it, it works. But again, I like the other one better, where I, if you just split this down the middle, this half was the, was the image that I ended up going with, I think, for. But they both have their, their strengths. This is kind of interesting. You've got this little crisscross diagonal thing going on. Um, again, the sky, the clouds are interesting. Um, so leave them in. And you'll notice that the, frame, the, the horizon line is slightly lower. It's not quite centered, but it's, it's just slightly below center. Uh, there was enough happening down 
in the lower part here with these leading lines that I wanted to, you know, that, that, that needs to be in there, I think. And these, the clouds are, because of the wide angle lens, the clouds look like they're coming down on a diagonal. And that's, again, another, uh, another thing that helps that image. Focus, again, we talked about focusing. Um, there's a lot in here that you could really struggle with if your focusing is set wrong. So this image, you need one focusing point to bypass all those flags in the foreground, if that's what you're after. So you guys are familiar with this. Yeah. This has been done a bazillion times, I think. <laughs> um, but again, very graphic. It's interesting. Hard to get nobody on the bridge. So if you're there at sunrise or something, uh, that's probably your better bet. And, and they, I think they recently had a lot of, in the last few years, there's been a lot of construction on the Brooklyn Bridge, right? So that's made it even harder. We've been through this already. Um, but again, just throwing these out, these little moments happen. And just having that, you know, the, the creative juices flowing all the time, and you're going to see things that nobody else will see. Is anybody into macro photography here? OK. Um, that's a whole other world of really interesting stuff. Uh, I took a picture for an article I'm doing right now on, on uh, macro, uh, extreme macro photography. So we make a lens called the MPE 65, which is a, you can get five times life size right. yeah. on this lens. And I specifically ramped it all the way out to 5X and I was out photographing basically ants. And I, and I ran across this little itty bitty flower, but you have no point of reference as to how, how little that flower is until I, I'm like, I need something with some perspective to show you the difference. And what I did was I'm like, what can I do? So I, I stuck a, um, a ballpoint pen right next to the flower. And the flower is about an eighth of the size of the tip of the ballpoint pen. But if you didn't see it, you would have no idea how big that flower is. So it, it, you know, good things come in small packages. And that was you know, perspective. I'm not saying that, that the pen added a great compositional aid, but for the article I was writing, it worked. Uh, but it, it's, it's, if you get into macro photography, there's, there's a whole other world there where, you know, that's literally like right here in this little candy dish, there's all kinds of cool pictures right there with one macro lens. You know, they're, they're there. You just have to find them. Hard to focus, though. It, it, well, it's hard to focus. Well, sure, it could be. Depend When you're up close like that, everything, the, the depth of field is tissue thin. Even at f16, it's, it can be tissue thin. So you have to work with, with the issue. And some of the things that uh, we're doing now require multiple exposures, so you can you know, focus stack. Um, those are things that we really didn't have in the film days. You know, so um, it, 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 it's a, just another tool in the toolbox. So elements of a great photograph, right, good subject. Do we have a good subject? Yeah, I think so in this one. Uh, but this is not just limited to this picture, but ask yourself, is what's in front of me and what I'm photographing, is it a good subject? And that, you may not know it's good until later. So maybe something happens. Um, Shadows and highlights, I mean, the contrast, does it play well with the subject? Um, it's hard to see on this particular image, but when you, know, when you have it on the monitor, uh, like on my computer monitor, you can see there's a lot of detail in here. Um, and there's just you know little streaks of sunlight coming in to illuminate her face, and they're not blown out. It just you know highlights and shadows and Sometimes you'll, I told her to move her face just slightly back and forth, and it ended up working real well because that one little bit of sun that was hitting her face, it, on the, from when, it, when I had it, she was leaned more to her right, which means it was illuminating her nose, which made her look like Rudolph. So I said, just slightly move back, and it took care of the problem. Okay. Uh, contours, we, you've seen this photograph before. Uh, it works with, with her and the shape of her hair and her body and everything with those archways in the background. It just mimics itself. Patterns, again, I'm going to 
kill. I'm going to take these pictures, some of these pictures out of here. I'm doing dealing this one to death. But uh, but whenever there's a pattern, you know, use it. Reflections. Take a look at this. Um, I think this one I got really lucky on. I was using an 800 millimeter lens on this image, and uh, at the right time. To, and the, the thing that I love about this is the the not only the the little wake from the ripples there, but but also I, the bird was moving this way, the, the blue heron. And right when the peak of that head in the reflection got to that point of the, the tree reflection in the background was when I took the shot. So I was shot probably 80 or 90 pictures during this, this series as it, the bird was walking through the scene. And that, that was the winner. Texture. Look at this. I mean, this thing screams with texture. I would love, I would have loved for there to be somebody riding a bike with either a yellow or a red jacket. <laughs> Didn't happen. Right, you know? You just carry those things around with you and just say, hey, hey go, go all the way down there. <laughs> Give them 10 bucks. Give them 10 bucks and yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, Um, where was this photograph? I can't remember. I can't remember. Thank you. Um, okay. Depth of field plays a big role in where you want your eye, your users, your, the, the image viewer's eye to go. And in this particular image, um, you know, this is just a field. And I didn't want all those distractions of different, you know, foliage and stuff in the background. So I just ramped the lens completely wide open. This was with a 400 millimeter uh, DO, diffractive optics lens. And um, all that stuff just goes creamy smooth in the background. If I close the lens down, you're going to start seeing more of those little details from the grasses and things like that. They're in the background. But, um, and you wait for stuff like this to happen. I waited for the mouth to be open, for the bird to be, for the bluebird to be singing, and you know. But on the uh, placed on the upper right third, right? Um, in the original image, there's you could see there's some spider webs that are f hanging from the uh, the grass or the twig there or whatever that is. Uh, they were distracting to me, so I just quick zapped them out. It was very simple. I didn't do much to it. That one you saw already, again, complementary colors. What's the opposite of blue? Yellow. Yellow. This works well together. And then, I mean, you, you could even go so far as to say playing with color. I mean, yeah, you go to the, the lighthouse, but you also go to the red roof down there at the end. Uh, it keeps your eye there. Uh, I would have also liked to have seen a lower camera angle on this just to have a different thing in the in the, you know, what to choose from. But this works great. This is not my photograph, but, um, and you'll even see, I think, I just saw, I thought I saw a rainbow in there, but I could be wrong. I'm not sure if that's, not sure what that is. But it's a very powerful photograph. Uh, a photographer named Rick Burke took this photograph, so it's, it's really nice. Framing, we talked about framing already, all right? I think I've driven that message home to you, this is considered framing. I mean, just filling that frame and then using other, you know, natural or unnatural pieces to take your eye away from what you don't want it to look at. And then balance. This has balance. She's in the lower third. Um, you know, you've got a lot here playing and waiting for the right time of day to so that light is balanced between what's back here and then the light striking her face uh, is works well there. Okay, so how lenses affect the scene? Have you ever had an idea of a photograph and you're thinking about it, and it's sitting there in front of you, but you don't know, okay, what, what is this photograph going to say to it? What, am I, what do I want this photograph to say? 
And sometimes you can create that through composition. Um, but think about that before you take the photograph. What's the end result going to be? Where, where do you want to go with this photograph? Instead of just taking it, let's start dissecting how you want this to speak to the viewer's eye. Then you can start thinking about what are the tools I'm going to need to accomplish that. And lenses are going to be a huge part of those choices. You know, anything, okay, is it going to be a graphic image where I want a wide angle approach where everything's going to be in focus, but now I have to use the, uh, you know, the, the depth of field as my main source of, um, of Im image, you know, drawing that user through the, the uh, viewer through the eye, through the, through the picture. Like Ansel Adams, right? We've all heard of Ansel Adams, yes? <laughs> We laugh, but some people, I've talked to the younger audiences now, and they're like, Gansel who? And it's okay. They, it's just not in their repertoire. I, I get it. Um, but Ansel Adams photographs are typically sharp from foreground to background, right? You've heard me say this. So Ansel was left with, with one of those things. Now, we talked about area of greatest contrast and area of sharpest focus. Well, if everything is in sharp focus, you're only left with one item to draw your, your viewer's eye through the image, and that's what? Contrast. So he was a master at controlling contrast and bringing your viewer's eye through the image, through contrast and leading lines, and I mean, all the stuff we're talking about. Um, if you haven't studied his work, you really are, are missing out. Uh, so knowing what lens to use. And that's going to, again, come through a lot of practice and just trying different things, experimenting. That's what this is all about. Um, you know, in the digital age, we can experiment a lot and it doesn't cost us anything. So depth of field, do you want a lot or a little? Again, pre-visualizing what that image is going to look like. And you may not be sure what it's going to look like. So let's try rolling through all the aperture settings, and then at least you've got something to choose from later that you can, you can work with. But oftentimes, that's why I, I shoot in aperture priority most of the time, because I know when I look at it at a scene, I, I'm pre-visualizing that. Do I want it, the background soft or do I want it sharp? What's the subject matter? If it's a person, uh, typically you want the focus to be on them, unless there are like, an, uh, like a an element in a greater picture. Uh, but typically, if I'm doing a portrait of somebody, I'll want their face to be sharp and everything else to be kind of really soft in the background. It draws your eye right to the area of greatest focus, or the great, uh, sharpest focus, which is the face. So in that case, I know I'm going to go to a wide aperture. And always focus on the eyes, if at all possible. If the eyes are out of focus, unless there's a creative reason to do it otherwise, your, your, your portrait is pretty much ruined. And if you've got an, a lens like the 85 1.2, where the, you know, or the 135 2.0, or something where the, you know, you've got the person's head turned and one eye is in focus and one eye is out, that's acceptable. But make sure that the eye is closest to the camera is sharp. Again, there's always reason to break the rules, and somebody online is probably saying, yeah, yeah, but, but, there's a creative reason to do it the other way, and there is. But general, I'm going to speak in generalities here, closest eye to the, to the camera really should be sharp. OK. Compression. Who can tell me what compression is? Does anybody know? Go for it. OK. So yeah, you're on the right clue. So, uh, so typically, when you have a wide angle lens, a lot of things are sharp. And everything in the background tends to look much smaller. If you have a telephoto lens, compression makes those, image, those, those items in the background tend to look larger. Even though they're out of focus a lot, a lot of times, they will look larger. So um, I think I have an example in here of that. So distortion, uh, you, again, with that image of the tidal basin down in Washington, DC, uh, the original image had a, a, a bow in the horizon line, which was very easily corrected. But distortion can help, and it can also hurt your image. I felt in that case it was hurting it, so I just 
straightened it out. Um, okay. If you can shoot on a tripod, it's not always, you know, a must have, but you're going to end up with sharper photographs typically, especially when you're working with uh, slower shutter speeds for sure. Um, it's a pain in the butt to take out, I know. And I typically don't like to use a tripod, but I have to force myself to do it sometimes. So how a lens affects the scene. Um, again, we asked this earlier when you're, when you're picturing what this thing's going to look like in your mind. What do you want it to say? And a lot of times that will, will dictate what you do next. In other words, what lens I'm going to choose, what angle I'm going to choose. In this particular picture here, all I did was have, I had a speed light on top of the camera and I put my camera down in the dirt in the midst of all these, uh, I think they're tulips. And it just worked. If I didn't have the speed light, all this would be silhouetted and it would have ruined the image for me. Did you have a small aperture to get that? Yes, so I know looking at this picture, looking at the sun, I can tell it was a very small aperture because that sun has a starburst to it and you don't get that when you're shooting wide open. Yeah, so um, the other little tidbit that I uh, will tell you is that when you have a lens with odd, an odd number of aperture blades, you will get, if, it's, if the sun's in the picture or another you know, like a light of some sort where you're going to get some sort of a starburst, you get twice as many starburst beams with an odd number of aperture blades than you will with an even number of aperture blades. So if you want a lot of that, look at how many aperture blades are on your lens and you'll see that. Okay. More cycling. What do you want it to say? This is just slow panning at like 15th of a second with moving objects. And eventually, through a lot of trial and error, you're going to get something sharp that, that really comes out pretty cool when you're doing that. I photograph a lot of bike racing, and this is something that I love, um, even though there's, I can, I'm looking right now and I see dirt on my sensor, <laughs> something you have to get clean. But again, you can easily spot it out. Uh, but the overall image is pretty cool when you've got a lot of blur and one, one guy sharp. And it's, it almost happens by accident because you just never know what you're going to get when you're, when you're panning with your subject. Uh, so like I said, I just photographed a bike race uh, Sunday and just culled through all my images and found like five or seven really, really great ones out of about 60 gigs worth of data. So it's a lot of delete, 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 delete. Oh, that could be interesting. And then, you know, you just keep deleting. So. Uh, this is that same child that you saw on the log with my son. Um, what does the picture say? Now for me, I know a little bit more of the backstory here. This child has a, a, little, musc a, a little bit of a muscular issue um, and he's struggled a lot. And so knowing that, um, you know, his, his legs are very small and, you know, compared to his head and, but it's, it's just an amazing, for me, an amazing photograph, not because I took it, but the eye contact that this child has with the camera is just amazing. And um, yeah, he's centered, but his head's on the upper third or close to it. Um, and it just screamed black and white. So do, do you guys shoot uh, RAW or JPEG? Raw. RAW, OK. And not that there's anything wrong with shooting JPEG. Um, but the ability to change your mind is kind of a big thing. And uh, if you shoot with JPEG, you have to be very sure of how you want that picture to look. So you set your camera up in the monochrome um, picture style. Because once you go, if you're just shooting JPEG, if you set your, your, your picture style to monochrome or black and white, you're stuck with that. You can't change it back. Um, in, in this in instance, I shot, I shoot everything in color and then I, I can tell later whether I want to go to black and white or anything. But this image just screamed to me that we work fantastic in black and white. And he's got red hair. So there was, you know, there's more strawberry blonde than, than red, but it's still on the red 
uh, hue, but it just worked. And even though there's there's those steps, those slate um, landing are going through his head, I think it's secondary to the impact that the eyes have. Mm -hmm. So whenever you can get something like this, shoot a lot. You know, it's just an amazing thing. And um, talking about macro, notice that the, the butterfly's eyes are sharp, but just beyond that, out of focus. So when you're working up close like this, you have to be really critical with your focus, and it's gonna, you're gonna have a lot of throwaways. But when you get it, you get it, and it, and it pays off. Okay, discovery, right? Uh, I photograph a lot of kids, and stuff like this, I can't tell a kid like this to do. He's like, oh, I have a hand. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, forgetting all this other stuff, but the leading lines in there are, are, are nice. Um, the one thing that's interesting about this, we talked about leading lines going out of the frame. This leading line here goes up to his face, but it also ends before it goes out of the frame. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? That's something that I tend to try to do whenever possible. It's not always possible, but um, it's a big thing. Okay, so... Can you guys tell me, and I mean, this is general terms, what, what kind of lens was used to photograph this? Telephoto. Telephoto? Anybody else have a different opinion? No, it could be a wide angle lens, but how can you be so close to him? Yeah. It could be a wide angle lens, but how but can you, you be so to, close to them? Yeah, you have to be close. Between that okay, so wide angle probably? Yeah. Yes. Okay, look at, so let's just look at, let's just look at what's in the photograph. Uh, what's what's happening in the background here with regards to focus? It's pretty sharp, right? Do you, do you see any of the mountains in the background there? Do they look kind of like they're they're blurry and up a little closer? Like that? Remember we talked about compression. Okay, so that kind of tells me that this is not a telephoto lens. This is probably something uh, on the wide angle side. Maybe not extreme wide angle, but it's going to be. Probably, as you said, in that 24 to 70 range, I'm thinking probably around 20, you know, 35, somewhere around there. Um, but the the wide angle lens on this is kind of telling you, or the the actual sharpness of this is telling you, and there's no compression really in there. That that's a wide angle lens. You have a deeper depth of field with wide angle lenses, inherent. Now this image, right? Telephoto lenses. How can we tell? Look at the look at the bokeh. Look at the compression. I mean, uh, some people call it bokeh. Some people call it bokeh. I call it bokeh. I just think it's nice when you have that kind of control over the background. Here's a really good example of thin depth of field, and you can see it. I mean, it's literally this this much space. And this is a telephoto lens. This is the 70 to 200, one of my go-to lenses for a lot of stuff that I do. Uh, at wide open aperture, at 200 millimeter lens, at 200 millimeter on the focal length, and I think this is a Junko, uh, but he's completely <laughs> sharp. And you can tell just by looking at the bricks how shallow that depth of field is. So you just have to be careful when you're working with wider apertures and telephoto lenses. Uh, where that depth of field is going to end. So you, that's why it's critical that you get those eyes fo focused and deep, you know, real sharp focus. Did you have a question? You're good? Okay, all right. Uh, all right. What about this? Wide angle. Wide angle? Yeah, tilt shift. Tilt shift? I don't, boy, man, I, I would not want to use a tilt shift for this. <laughs> um, this is a tough one, right? How far away are those balloons? Right? This is kind of tricky. This was with the 70 to 200. But these balloons are further away. They're, you know, and so that inherent depth of field is going to you know, cover me. I, I'm probably at f11 or 16 here. Um, but if these balloons were closer to me, I would, I would have said, yeah, there's a wide angle lens there. But there's, there's virtually no distortion in this image. And the, one other thing, the clouds back there look closer. If I had a wide-angle lens, those clouds would be much smaller. So that's kind of 
it's it's a tough it it's hard to really get there if if you didn't know what I shot with but it, it, it can be a tricky one okay so how lenses affect the scene depth of field we've been mentioning this a little bit but a little bit 2.8 look what's sharp look what's not sharp where's your eye go face face exactly plus the leading lines that are even though they're soft the eye goes to the face Wide angle, F22, everything's sharp. Somewhere in between, you know, where you want a little bit sharp. And, you know, if you look at those columns in the background there, they're not as sharp as, as if we were to close the lens down more. Um, you know, that's all you have to do is kind of figure out where you want your viewer's eye to go. And if you're photographing a group of people where you want, you know, you've got people at different distances in a group, that's where things become tricky and you have to really be mindful of the aperture selection because you could have the front row sharp and just somebody right behind them could be out of focus. And if, you, if they're out of focus, the picture is ruined. So um, you could make a small picture and they won't look as out of focus, but if you make it big, forget about it. <laughs> All right. Okay, so compression. Well, I talked about this. So I'm going to show you uh, something that will kind of, in a visual way, explain what it is. Uh, compression I use in, in, all the time in portraiture. A lot of, you'll see it in wildlife as well. Um, this is an example. This is a 50 millimeter lens, which is con a normal focal length lens closest to what your eye is used to seeing. Um, there's no distortion on it. Um, it's okay, nothing wrong with it. But take a look, I want you to just take a look at the background and visually remember what those bricks look like at this particular point. I'm gonna put them side by side so you can <laughs> see the difference, but look. That's the 70 to 200 at 140 millimeters. And look at the background, how much closer it looks to her. That's compression. Plus it's softer. And these were both photographed at the same aperture. So this is, becomes a very powerful tool with portraits or wildlife in particular, uh, where you're focusing right on the face or the eyes and everything else using wide, up, wide apertures, like f2.8 or f4, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood, will really draw that attention into the face of your, of your subject. Okay. Distortion, um, is it helping or hurting? You know, again, that's a subjective question. Uh, again, characteristics of wide-angle lenses, the, the wider that lens is, the broader that in depth of field is going to be, even at wide open apertures. Like if you have a 14 millimeter f2.8 lens, you're going to have a whole heck of a lot of depth in that photograph. And the only way you're going to be able to get a shallower depth of field is by moving very close to your subject. That's the only way you're going to get it. So you don't necessarily need the you know apertures of like f22 or 32 on a lens like the 14 millimeter because a lot of it's already built in uh, and what are you photographing a lot of people that are photographing uh, you know landscape scenes that's typically you know not always but typically you see a lot of landscape photographs where everything is sharp um, but not always you can use a telephoto lens for uh, landscape photography as well and you know we've used that at Yellowstone this past week we were using 400 millimeters to bring everything closer but you, you get that compression uh, and you create a different overall look linear distortion does anybody know what this is okay so have you ever seen lenses like the 14 millimeter or the 11 to 24 where the, the front lens element is this bulbous looking glass mm -hmm. those types of lenses um, well, fisheye is a little different. Fisheye is done to give you extra distortion. Yeah. Where, like the lens, like the 14 millimeter or the 11 to 24, have that that round front. There's a lot of they call it rectilinear dis distortion um, or correction, I should say. And what that does is, that as long as the camera is leveled, there you're not going to see any bowing in straight lines. 
vertically or horizontally. Um, as soon as you start tipping that lens forward or backward, then you'll start seeing it. But as long as you're level, you won't see that. Okay? Now you pay for that, but that's, yeah. So here you can see the distortion. Do you see the, the converting, converging lines? So when you look at, when you look at this, it, it, or actually here's a really good example here, how it, it, it goes up toward the center, it's pointing towards the center of the frame. In, in architecture photography, this is kind of a no-no. That's why the tilt shift lenses exist because you want these these horizontal or the I'm sorry these vertical uh, lines to be parallel to the side of the frame, and that's what those those lenses do to correct for those. Not that it's wrong; it's just the right tool for the job if that's what you're doing. If you're photographing for an architectural magazine and you give them that, they're going to laugh at you. So, um, you know, looking up here again. But you can use this distortion to your advantage in certain images. Again, not that it's wrong. It just depends on what your final output is or what, you know, what it's for. Again, here's that Jefferson Memorial up close. You can see the, the columns and everything just kind of <laughs> distorts in. But in this, in this image, it kind of works. You know, This is inside the Capitol building in DC. This is with a fisheye. This is with the 8 to 15. And um, you know, I, what I did was I laid the camera on the ground with just a slight tilt. And now this lens is really going to bow everything. It, you got, squint, squint at this picture and tell me what you see. Do you see an eye? So there's, I didn't even see that when I did it. I, when I'm looking at it later, I'm like, oh, wow, that's kind of cool. It looks like an eye. And if you turn it upside down, the little pillars there look like eyelashes, <laughs> you know? OK, so what about this? What are we looking at here? Stalin. What kind of technique was used? Stalin, yeah. <laughs> that we, uh, technique that we use like uh, leading lines? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, I'm pushing you along. <laughs> OK. Um, what about this? Somebody in here said, I, I don't know. I didn't photograph that. Yeah. Lenin? Yeah. I'm going to defer to you because it wasn't my photo. I was not there. <laughs> what technique was uh, used on this? There's a couple here. Well, rule of thirds. Okay. What about the what about the aperture setting? What are we looking at? Maybe yeah. wide aperture. Yeah. Okay. Rule of thirds was the typically one that I want went for there. What about this? As far as composition goes, what what was used here? What would would we employ to get this picture? Color. 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 Yes. Color. Absolutely. Rule of thirds. You know. All right. But color was really what I was going for here, since we just covered the rule of thirds. What about this? I'm going to push you a little more here on this one. Framing. Dude, you're on it. Perfect. Yeah, look at this. I mean, just frame the subject. It's great. What about this? Technique. High key. High key. Yeah, you're right. I can't argue with you there. Negative space. Negative space. Yes. Good. What about here? What'd you say? Leading, Leading lines, yes, from the from the, the light, the green light. She also pushed her very, very way to the right. Yeah, she's all the way to the right. Okay, so I can't say the rule of thirds here, but what about color? Uh, yeah. I mean it's uh, did you someone say color? Yeah. I didn't hear you. But yeah, absolutely, color. And contrast. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's multiple things in this image that are going for it. So, what about this? This is Yellowstone. Sharpness. Say again? Sharpness. Sharpness? No, the front is so sharp, it's like popping out. So we have foreground, middle ground, background, right? right. We've got leading lines. Look at this. Yes. 
I wouldn't say use of color, but contrast, right? Where does your eye go? I mean, there's lots of places your eye can go, but I do end up here because of the leading lines. I had to help it along a little bit with the leading lines to end up where uh, this photographer was. But, you know, and then at the end here, there's your block. Keeps you from exiting the frame. Again, is it right or wrong? I don't know, but it worked for me. <laughs> my wife just, for full disclosure, my wife is holding on to his feet. <laughs> okay. This is a covered bridge down near where I live. But, uh, but okay, so what technique was used here? Framing. Negative space, framing. I mean, it gives a lot of different things here. All right. Pattern interruption, patternist interruptious. Patternus interruptus. Yeah, lots of stuff. Now, I'm about 250 feet up higher than she is. I'm in Philadelphia. I'm on the Ben Franklin Bridge, photographing into a park underneath the bridge with a 300 millimeter lens. She didn't even know I took this picture, but. She just did that, and I'm like, bam, 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 you know. So, um, but I love the graphic nature of this image. Would I have loved uh, somebody with a little different outfit? Maybe, perhaps, but she just, she was pulling her hair back, and it just worked. So, there she is. She's famous now. Pattern interruption. I mean, there's all kinds of different things. You've got the diagonal lines, you know, that just, it, for me, it was kind of cool. The intersection between the patterns. Yeah. This was last week in Yellowstone. We drove by this, and I drove another mile down the road, and I said, uh, my colleague Drew was with me in the car as we were heading to this workshop, and I said, did you see what I saw back there? He said, yeah, I didn't want to say anything, because we were kind of on a timeline, and I said, we need to go back, don't we? He says, yeah. So we went back, and fortunately, they, were, they stood there for a good half an hour as we went all up and down this hillside photographing it. Uh, at different angles, and I thought it was really kind of cool. You don't see that every day. <laughs> so, uh, there's a lot of cool, have any of you guys been to the um, Canon Digital Learning Center before? No. Okay. There's, this is the website. It's completely free. There's tons of great opportunities to, to learn there. Who's, <laughs> who's ringing? Anyway. Um, USA.canon.com uh, is the main website. Learn.USA.canon.com. I know it's a lot of dots, but just if you don't write this down, you can just Google Canon Digital Learning Center. And there's tons of cool stuff up there. It's all free. Um, articles get updated regularly. There's all kinds of cool uh, product previews of new products. Uh, there's a blog. There's articles on just about anything from high-speed sync on your speed lights to composition, stuff like that, or how to get even sharper photographs. There's all kinds of great stuff there that it's a tremendous uh, resource for you. There's also, that, that, was, that one's free. This, this here on the uh, other website, for the main, the main website, the shop.usa.canada.com, there's some other more intensive workshops uh, that we filmed for you. Those are a little more uh, on the pay side of things, not real heavy on the dollar, but uh, there are some there. And uh, some cool stuff you should check out, lots of different subject matter. If you want to contact us, up top there is our, on our Canon Digital Learning Center, you can get a message to me if you'd like. Uh, if you'd want to do something on Instagram, there's my Instagram. Um, I'm not going to go crazy with anything Facebook because I like to generally keep that just my local friends. But um, uh, but if you want to reach me, either of those two ways would be a good way to do it. Listen, thanks for spending a couple hours with me today. So again, thanks to B&H. Um, Canon, we were huge into education. So again, check out the Canon Digital Learning Center. There's lots of cool stuff there and enjoy the rest of your day.